this is Mr. Coates and this is Apes Lecture number 27 on the fossil fuel coal. Uh, if you've ever been to the power plant here in uh, uh, near Tampa, the Big Bend Power Station, they use coal at their station and coal is the place where we get all of our electricity in this area. So it's important to know what is coal, what are the environmental impacts of coal, and uh, what are some of the possible alternatives to coal in the future? Well, how did coal form? Coal is a fossil fuel, therefore it's made up of remains from dead organisms and mostly plants. Uh, and so a long time ago, a planet was covered with a lot of swamps and uh, plant types that live in swamps. And the planet was much warmer then. And over periods of time, these plants would die. They'd probably get buried by sediments fairly quickly. Uh, they'd go under pressure and heat, and uh, so this proce process of coalification then would take the carbon structures that were in those plants and turn them into a carbon structure that is now coal. Now, coal doesn't have any set structural uh, chemical formula to it. It's just uh, mostly hydrocarbons with some sulfur and nitrogen thrown in. Uh, there are different types of coal, and so therefore there are different types of formulations for coals. The precursor to coal, however, is peat, and peat is in between the uh, decomposing of that plant matter and the pressurization and the heating of it uh, before it turns into coal. And even today, people still burn peat for fuel, and uh, they do this quite a lot in Ireland where people will actually dig peat out of the ground and dry it in big bricks, and then they will burn it for fuel there. But peat isn't as efficient as coal is, but uh, peat is one step just before coal. All right, so there are different types of ranks of coal, and you need to know these different types and why they're different. So the first type here is called anthracite, also known as hard coal. The important parts about anthracite, it has the highest heat content. And uh, so that makes uh, anthracite really good. It has a very high net energy to it. It also has a very low sulfur content, which is really good as well, because then we don't put out pollution uh, through the burning of sulfur. It is also the oldest type of coal. It's been in the ground the longest, and it's the best type of coal. The only drawback with this type of coal is there's not that much of it. Uh, unfortunately, here in the United States, we don't have a whole lot of anthracite deposits. Now the next type of coal is bituminous. Now bituminous is uh, the uh, most common coal we have here in the United States. It's a very good coal. It has a very high heat content. However, it also has a high sulfur content. So when you burn bituminous, which is this one right here, uh, you get a lot of SO2 coming off of that. That's a problem when you burn coal, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this is known as bituminous. Now the other type of coal, which is this one down here, is just one step past peat, and it's known as lignite, or brown coal. It has a low heat content, and this is because it has a high moisture content, and so it takes a lot of energy to turn that water into steam and, and basically boil that water off before you can actually use that type of coal. Uh, the good thing about it, though, it does have a low sulfur content, so it doesn't have a high net energy, but it does have a low sulfur content, so you don't get too much air pollution from that one. It is the youngest type of coal, as I said, and it's just one step past peat. Now, in the United States, our coal deposits are vast. We have one of the highest coal deposits in the world, and so uh, we have a large area here in the eastern part around Appalachia. Uh, West Virginia has got lots of coal. In fact, most of the state of West Virginia is covered in coal. Ohio has large deposits, Pennsylvania, uh, the Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, uh, Illinois, uh, and Indiana also have very large deposit of coal over here. And then uh, through Iowa, parts of Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma also have large deposits of coal. And then there's some up here in uh, Michigan and down here in Texas. All right, so what are some advantages and disadvantages of coal? So let's go to the pros first. First of all, we have a very abundant source of this type of fossil fuel here in the United States. It is actually the most abundant fossil fuel in the world. Um, and that's one reason why I've been using it for so long. It actually started the Industrial Revolution. And so coal has been around for a long time. Uh, at cons current consumption rates, it would last us 300 years plus. And so that's quite a lot of uh, energy use out of this particular resource. Uh, and once again, it has very high net energy yield. So it's a really good fuel source. However, there are some cons to it. Highest in carbon dioxide. Since there are so many carbons and hydrogens associated with coal, you put out a lot of carbon dioxide. 
Also, you put out a lot of sulfur dioxide with this. And also, the mining of it can cause a lot of environmental degradation. And sometimes, even the waste can cause problems because you get radioactive waste from it. And you also get uh, mercury from it and things like that. So, there's a major health problem with coal. When and then, also, it is the direct cause of most of the acid rain in the world. So, who has the coal? Well, we do. And China. China has large deposits of coal and they use this uh, in many of their power plants. And this is one of the reasons why China has a lot of air pollution. And you can see that uh, they have a lot of megawatt or gigawatt capacity when it comes to power plants here based on coal. We are second when it comes to that. All right, I mentioned sulfur. Sulfur is a huge problem when we burn coal. Um, sulfur dioxide is released, and when sulfur dioxide mixes with uh, rainwater or uh, water in the atmosphere, we get H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Uh, so if you look at this picture down here, this brown looking cloud right here over this city, and it looks like it's Manhattan. I'm not really sure, but it looks like Manhattan. And you see this brown cloud, and this is a sulfur-based cloud. There's a lot of sulfur dioxide in this from burning. There's particulate in here. This is what you usually see uh, when you have problems with sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, there are some ways to remove this sulfur dioxide. The first one is solvent refining, and basically that's when they actually treat the coal with some kind of solvents to get rid of the SO2. However, that's expensive and lowers the net energy. We can do coal gasification, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or we could do liquefaction. And then the way that most power plants clean up coal are using uh, scrubbers. And so uh, we'll go into how scrubbers and uh, things like that work in a minute to remove this SO2. So what are some of the alternatives to coal? Well, you can actually take coal and make some other fuels with it. So one of those is coal gasification. So you can actually take coal and you turn it into synthetic natural gas. So in this case what we do is that we add uh, oxygen in here with uh, pulverized coal and then you pump in some water. And so this creates an emulsified type of coal and then we heat it up really hot and that creates natural gas. And so the natural gas then can be uh, then shunt it over to a cleaning station where it's cooled down or stored and then you can burn it again to turn a turbine here which turns a generator which produces our electricity. And then we get out all the uh, deposits at the end which is slag. All right, we can also do coal liquefaction. In this case you take coal and you add certain chemicals to it and turn it into like a liquid fuel. Now like I said there are some disadvantages. Typically, there's a high environmental impact. We get low net energy because we're using more energy to produce these things. And we have a high environmental impact because of this nasty stuff that comes out at the end. Could have mercury in it, could have lead in it, could have uh, some other toxins in it. And also, this is much more costly than just using coal by itself. However, if we need to ever burn coal, say like in a internal combustion engine for like a car, we could always go this route eventually. How do coal-fired power plants work? Well, the coal is burned at very high temperatures inside what we call a boiler. And so then in the boiler, the heat uh, vaporizes water in the pipeline and converts that water into steam. The steam then spins a turbine, and the turbine is what actually turns the generator, and the generator creates electricity. If we look at this down here, we have uh, the coal coming up into this coal bunker where they hold the coal um, for a little while, and then they pulverize the coal. In order to get the best burn from coal and get the most energy out of it, they pulverize it to a fine powder. This powder then is blown into the boiler, and the boiler then heats up this pipe that's inside that has the water in it, and the water turns to steam, and then the steam turns the turbine, which turns the generator and this produces the electricity through the lines. And so all power plants typically have this part. They typically have some way that the water is boiled, then that steam turns a turbine which turns a generator which produces electricity. So it doesn't matter what the fuel is, all power plants or electrical power plants will have this feature. It's just how do they produce the heat that's different. Now later on that water can be recondensed using a tower cooler here, a cooling tower. So this cooling tower uh, basically lets that water fall down and cool as it does and then it collects and so that can be resent back to 
the condenser and the boiler to be reused and then some of it actually comes out the top as steam and then so that's what this white cloud is here um, and then some of the flue gas then comes out here and gets filtered and I'll talk about how that works here in a second and then anything that's toxic can get trucked away to a landfill also the boiler will also take this put stuff here at the bottom this is called slag and we'll talk about what that is here in a minute but uh, all these particulates and things happen. Now some of the um, filtration devices that you'd find in the filter part of the power plant uh, electrostatic precipitator. Now electrostatic precipitators they take particles out that have charges to them so there's a lot of particles that have a plus or minus charge to them and so these electrostatic precipitators are charged. They have electrical charge to them and they, op they tr attract the opposite charge just kind of like a magnet. And so after a while these bars or these rods that are charged will get coated with all kinds of particles and other pollutants and they can turn off the power to those and then they can scrape off all these pollutants and then dispose of them properly. I mentioned scrubbers before and we'll talk about those here in a minute but scrubbers their main job is to remove the sulfur dioxide. When we get all these wastes at the end what do we do with them? Um, we used to just landfill them or just put them on the ground somewhere but we found out that some of these are toxic so we need to somehow deal with them in a uh, good way. So the sulfur dioxide because in the um, United States we have strict rules through the uh, Clean Air Act now, we can't release uh, sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere in great quantities. So the power plants have learned that they spray these gases that come out of the, uh, the boiler, these flue gases, are sprayed with a mixture of water and limestone. And what happens is that the limestone reacts with the sulfur dioxide and produces a product called gypsum. Later on, that gypsum can be used in a wallboard and uh, so we have a lot of gypsum production here in Florida. In fact, all of the gypsum produced at our Tico plant does go towards gypsum wallboard. Also, our phosphate industry also produces a lot of gypsum in a different process here. Now, the other thing that is produced is fly ash. And this is fine particulates that are created by the burning of coal. And so your electrostatic precipitators take a lot of that out, as well as some other kinds of filters uh, like bag filters, which remove particulates. And then this stuff can be used in concrete and cement. The last thing that comes out the bottom of the boiler is called slag. Okay, and slag is usually a very hard glass-like material that can be used for sandblasting. can also be used in cement. It's usually fairly uh, good for those uses. However, sometimes it will have some other toxic issues with it. There might be some low-level radioactive uh, radiation coming off of it. There might be some mercury involved in there as well. So we have to be careful. And this is our slag right here in this picture. And you see these little bitty glass beads. Obviously, this is blown up very large here. This is gypsum here. And this is your fly ash down here. I mentioned China earlier. China has a lot of coal and they use it primarily for uh, electricity. Now, we have to realize that China has gone through a rapid phase of industrialization. They have tried to keep up with everyone else in the world to try and become a dominant country. And so they have built a lot of coal-fired power plants to use their high supply of coal. And they've done it very quickly. The problem is they haven't done it to, uh, to our standards, so they have very low pollution control on their power plants. Their power plants consequently put out very high levels of CO2 and sulfur dioxide. And this causes a huge problem in China. We look here, this is a picture of in Beijing uh, during a smog time, and you can barely see any of the buildings here in Tiananmen Square. Uh, people are wearing masks in order to keep the particulate out of their lungs. A lot of this is sulfur dioxide. And so when you breathe in this sulfur dioxide, it turns into sulfuric acid in your lungs and burns your lungs and your throat. And it can burn your eyes as well. And so it's just not very healthy for you at all. And in China, the World Health Organization estimates that 360,000 people die prematurely in China because of air pollution. And this is a huge problem for China. They uh, always have huge air alerts during, especially the summer months. Uh, their, their, their smog just gets really unbearable and their cities almost shut down because of it. Um, we're just starting to realize that some of this air pollution is affecting the western United States. A uh, bunch of researchers there in uh, California did a study on 
some of these smog that was coming into LA and San Francisco and uh, they traced it all the way back to China and what we call we call this the grasshopper effect and this is because the pollution moves from where it's been created to someplace else and affects someplace else and uh, this is happening here in the United States and uh, in California and well, I hope that helps you understand coal and the issues with coal. And if you have any questions, make sure you bring those to class uh, when this set of notes is due.